All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, shortly. Um, over the next three days, the president will participate in events in Colorado, California, and Oregon, highlighting the progress we have made from passing a historic bipartisan infrastructure law to passing the Inflation Reduction Act, which will lower prescription drug costs. You'll hear the president discuss these accomplishments for the American people, and you'll also hear in California and Oregon, the president draw a stark contrast between his and the con and congressional Democrats' plan to protect Medicare and lower health care costs, and the MAGA Republicans in Congress, Congress, Congress's plan put Medicare on the chopping block and repeal the IRA, which will increase prescription drug costs. To be clear, the Inflation Reduction Act. Today, as you all know, we're en route to Camp Hale, Colorado, where the president will talk about the administration's efforts to protect and restore America's most cherished lands for future generations. The president will establish the Camp Hale Continental Divide National Monument in honor of our nation's veterans, indigenous people, and their legacy. This is the first time President Biden is designating a new national monument, and today's designation of Camp Hale will support jobs in America's outdoor recre recreation economy. In addition, the president will also announce funding through the Inflation Reduction Act to mitigate the impacts of drought in the Colorado River Basin. The <laughs> president looks forward to being joined at today's historic announcement by Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, CEQ Chair Brenda Mallory, Senator Michael Bennett, Senator John Hickenlooper, Governor Jared Polis, and local and tribal leaders. Finally, tomorrow in Los Angeles, the president will join Congress, Congresswoman Karen Bass and other officials to see progress on LA Metro's Purple Line through LA County. Thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, we have made historic infrastructure investments in public transit projects like LA's Purple Line, which will create jobs and opportunities, reduce traffic and, and pollution, and increase opportunities across LA. On Friday and Saturday, the president will participate in events in California and Oregon, highlighting his efforts to lower prescription drug costs, protect Medicare, and strengthen Social Security, and to fight efforts to congressional, by congressional Republicans to put Medicare and Social Security on the chopping block and reinstate giveaways to Big Pharma. We'll have more details to share on those events. If only people on the ground knew, could know what's, knew what was going on up here at this time. Uh, with that, Colleen, you want to you want to kick us off? Yes. Everybody, hold on very tight. Uh, yeah. So the CPR on Thursday is expecting to show that co the yeah, sorry, CPI, CPR, CPI. I'm sorry. Um, is expected to show that um core inflation uh rose. Um, and then yesterday we had the president saying that um in his interview with Jake Tapper, I think that if there's going to be a recession, it'll be a small one, which I think is a change from what he said previously, which he thinks there is not, which he said there wasn't going to be a recession. So are you changing, are you preparing, you know, for job losses? I mean, how, what's, is the posture changing on the economy based on what we're expecting? To take the one part of your question first, um, so, which is what the president said last night on uh, during his interviews. Look, the president has been pretty um, consistent, has said multiple times in the past, while a recession is possible, he does not think there will be a recession. Uh, we take this unique global economic uh, moment very seriously, as you've heard me say, as you've heard him say, and the president wants the American people to know that because of, the, of America's uh, resilience and because of the president's economic plan that we have seen throughout the 20 months, uh, we are in a stronger position than any other country to navigate these global challenges uh, that we're that we're seeing in front of us, and so uh, so that hasn't changed. He's been very consistent about that. I spoke a little bit about the CPI numbers yesterday. Look, our num our number one 
uh, focus when it comes to the president's economic plan is lowering costs for the American people, making sure that we are tackling uh, inflation. And we understand we have more work to do. We get that the American people are feeling um, at that pinch, but we've also seen some progress. Uh, and it's important to note the progress that we have seen uh, over the last uh, several months. And so that's real disposable income and real consumer spending both increased in part thanks to the strength of our job market. Uh, gas prices, as I've talked about many times, we've seen we saw we've seen it come down over the last several months of over a dollar uh, per gallon since the peak of this summer, and that's uh, and that's overall decline of about 22 percent. And we've, we're giving families a little bit more breathing room with the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it's going to bring down everyday costs, as you heard me say at the top, when it comes to health care costs, when it comes to uh, Medicare being able uh, to uh, lower those costs for our seniors because they're or, or able, are they going to be able to negotiate. All of those things are things that Democrats and this president have, Demo congressional Democrats and this president has worked very hard to do over the last several months. And, uh, and it's a really a stark difference from what you're seeing uh, from Republicans, from MAGA Republicans, congressional Republicans in this particular. Can you, uh, can you give any updates on the president's thinking and the White House's thinking about recalibrating the relationship with Saudi Arabia? The president was asked this, I think you guys may have heard um, uh, right before he took off, and he was clearly asked this uh, last night. Um, look, I know folks have been asking about a timeline. Uh, look, as he said last night, as he said this morning, uh, when, the, when the House and the Senate get back, we'll discuss and make decisions in a de deliberate way. Uh, but he was very clear, there will be consequences. Uh, we believe the decision that OPEC Plus made last week was a mistake, uh, and it was short-sighted. And so we, are, we have said, and I said this yesterday during the briefing, that uh, the pre from the beginning, the president has talked about recalibrating, uh, uh, readjusting our relationship uh, with, with, Saudi, with Saudi Arabia, and uh, now we're, we're going to get into a process uh, where uh, we'll review that and we'll have more to share on that. In this, in this era of telephones and email and text messaging, um, does he really have to wait for Congress to get back into town, or could conversations be starting now, and are they? Has he spoken to Bob Menendez or others? We're, look, we're going to review, we're going to, uh, we're going to review where we are. Uh, we'll be watching closely over the coming weeks, right, and months, uh, what's going to be happening with this decision that OPEC Plus made. And But there's going to be consultation with our allies. There's going to be consultation with Congress, and decisions will be made in a deliberate way. We want to be very deliberate about this. Um, and that is going to take some time. I don't have, again, I don't have a timeline for you. Uh, and so, and also, I don't want to get ahead of what the president is ultimately uh, going to decide. And again, he spoke to this last night. He spoke to this this morning to some of your colleagues uh, who, who asked him this very question. I just ask one more, which is, has he called the L.A. City Council members or anyone else uh, involved in that scandal there? I know that you said yesterday he believes that the, the three of them should resign. Has he expressed that to them? I don't have any calls to preview at this time. As you know, we're, we're headed to California right after uh, Colorado. But I want to be very, very explicit about this, as I was yesterday. Uh, racism has no place in our society, uh, and particularly no place coming from our elected, uh, elected officials and elected leaders in this case. Uh, these council members should all resign. Uh, the president is clear about this. I laid that out yesterday. Their comments were hateful, and they were wrong. And uh, but I but I will also note that calling out racist and hateful speech should not be a, a partisan issue. It should be not because of one side or it should be hard to do. And so we'll always call out racism. And the question that I have and that we have and that I put out yesterday is is uh, Republicans, are they going to do this as well? You know, we when Democrats say something racist or anti-Semitic, we should hold them accountable. And when MAGA Republican says, a MAGA Republican says something racist or anti-Semitic, they are embraced by cheering crowds and, and become celebrated and sought after endorsements. That's a, that's a problem. That should not be. And so what you won't see uh, from us is uh, us defend the, the indefensible just because the person has a D next to their name. 
two foreign policy questions. Just back to Saudi real quick. If the July trip wasn't about oil, why are there consequences for Saudi cutting oil? And then but tied to that, does that also mean there will be consequences for the other GCC members that are members of OPEC Plus as well? So look, we're going to review where we are. Um, and we'll have more to share once we have go on into that review. Look, we were very clear that the OPEC, and you're right, the OPEC plus decision is multiple members. The card, the clearly so, uh, Saudi Arabia is the chair of, of OPEC plus. Um, and the way that we have seen it, and I said this, it, it was short-sighted. It was a mistake because it's actually going to hurt uh, e uh, countries with, um, uh, you know, middle and income economies. And that is that is something that we should react to while we're looking at the global challenges that are in front of us. And the way we see it, it was short-sighted because it was, you know, it was a decision that was self-interest decision. And uh, and so, you're, you know, we have been very clear to your point, uh, our trip, uh, our trip uh, this, this past summer to the Middle East was not about oil. Yes, it was energy security uh, a topic. Absolutely, energy security was a topic. But the mistake that we see right now is, the, is what it helped us to see. Which, again, was a mistake to, uh, uh, to the decision that they made. Again, it's, its, own, it's on its own uh, purported self-interest, and it was short-sighted, and that's what we're going to react to. One more. President's assessment or evaluation that President Putin is a rational actor who made a bad strategic decision, um, that term carries weight in the nuclear context. What, what's that based on, the idea that he's, he's still a rational actor in the, the broader context of things? Is that an intelligence assessment, the president's opinion? How do we view that? As you know, the president, when it comes to foreign policy and when it comes with relationship with leaders, he was a senator for 36 years and he was a vice president for eight years. This is a place that, a, a, an arena, if you will, that he knows very well. Uh, what, the president was very clear. What he said was Putin was a rational actor who, who badly miscalculated. And we have talked about why he badly miscalculated. If you look at how strong the NATO alliance is, Putin thought he would break that up. And it was a miscalculation because what he is seeing is a stronger NATO, uh, what he is seeing is a strong West, and what he is seeing is a coalition that has that we have never seen before as far as uh, the strength uh, of, of uh, the countries coming together to support uh, Ukraine. And, and that has been the case all along. And so that's what he was talking about. That's the context uh, that he was leaning into. And so I will leave those words and his comments there. Putin is saying that he believes that the world's energy infrastructure is at stake after Nord Stream. Does the U.S. also see it that way? And are there still efforts to support Europe? So, look, we have, so first of all, and we've been very clear about this, that, um, the, that President Putin uh, is weaponizing energy, and that's what we see him doing uh, uh, for the past several months. And so we've been very, very clear about that. And we have also been very committed as well uh, to helping Europe diversify uh, uh, as well when it comes to oil. And, uh, and uh, the EU's created a task force uh, that is addressing this issue. And so we are going to do everything that we can uh, to, help, uh, to help Europe in, in this time. And we know, like, we understand that, you know, the winter month is coming and we understand uh, how uh, how difficult it's going to be, but we are committed, and uh, we have been in conversation uh, with uh, with our European allies for the past several months on how to to, to go about that. I just wanted to follow up on what Phil just asked. I, I guess what we would like to get clarity on is why the president thinks Vladimir Putin is a rational actor. I mean, I'm gonna just let his words stand. He's a rash. He said the president's words. He's a rational actor who badly miscalculated. He miscalculated uh, what his aggression, uh, what his uh, war that he created uh, against Ukraine would lead to. And, uh, and we've seen that, you know, Putin has become a pariah. We know what he said. We're just curious why he thinks he's a rational actor. Again, the, I'm gonna just let the president's word stand for itself. He, he said he's a rational actor that's miscalculated. A lot of open questions, what he said. I don't think it leads to a lot of open question. The president was very clear. It was an interview that he did. He was asked multiple times about uh, Putin. He was asked multiple time, times about 
uh, the war that uh, Putin started, and the president answered it uh, in in the way that he believed in in uh, you know again being in in this foreign policy space for some time as a U.S. senator, as a vice president, uh, leading the foreign policy effort when he was vice president in the in the Obama. Uh, Biden administration and now as president, uh, you know, he has a sense of, uh, of what he is seeing. He has an understanding of, of what, it, what, what has been occurring these last 19, 20 months. He has had multiple conversations uh, with Putin, as you all know, as we've read out certainly over the past 19 months. Look, you know, the most important thing that the president has been very consistent uh, about how he, we are going to continue to support Ukraine uh, we've been very consistent on um, the, the security assistance that we are providing Ukraine, more uh, very historic assistance, more than $17 billion. Uh, the president spoke to Zelensky just the other day. He had a conversation uh, as well with G7 and Zelensky just yesterday that we read out. I think what's the most important thing is uh, how much we're committed and we're in this as long as as long as long as it will last. We want it to end as soon as possible. Clearly, the war that uh, the aggression that Putin has has created, the war that the Putin has created in, in Ukraine. Uh, but we are committed uh, to helping Ukraine uh, fight, uh, supporting Ukraine, fight for its freedom uh, and fight for its democracy. And that is the most important thing. And yes, you know, again, the president said, you know, Putin miscalculated and. You've seen that. We've all seen that. You've all have reported on what Putin thought would happen and has not. Um, last night, the president at a fundraiser said that the Supreme Court is, quote, more of an advocacy group than even handed. I'm wondering if the president's position on uh, reforms to the Supreme Court has changed. If you can give us a little bit more context about what he meant by that comment and whether he thinks there should be any sort of changes or repercussions uh, given his assessment of, of that uh, branch of government? What he said is pretty consistent um, with how he has reacted, how we have reacted after the Dobbs decision first leaked, uh, which was several months ago, as you all know, and it's based on his respect for the institution as someone who spent decades working to strengthen it, uh, strengthen it and our courts right uh, writ large as you all know he was a he was a former Senate Judiciary Committee chair so the president believes the Supreme Court must be nonpartisan and committees to uphold and com and committed to upholding the Constitution and the rule of law regardless of politics that's something that he has believed since he was uh, the chair of the Judiciary Committee so that's why ever since the Dobbs uh, ever since the Dobbs uh, a decision you've heard from the president directly his he expressed his deep concern that this was an extreme and radical decision based on throwing out many decades of precedent we got to remember this was uh, almost 50 years of a precedent that we saw uh, the Supreme Court overturned and that had been upheld by judges uh, appoint, appointed by presidents of both parties and that this was the first time in recent years the court had made a sharp departure from established precedent to take a right away and he was very clear about that he was very clear about the extreme uh, action at, of the Dobbs decision so as someone who respects the court he respects the court he respects the institution of the court that has never changed he's actually said that the past several months uh, he's distressed by uh, you know and, and so is the American people we've seen that from the American people as well that especially when other fundamental rights uh, recognize uh, uh, recognized based on the right to privacy are under threat uh, like the right to marry and use con and, and use contraception so he res continues to respect the, cons the, the institution, uh, but he, he, will, he will speak out, and he has spoken out by this particular decision and how extreme it was. So a quick follow-up. Abortion is one of the issues that is most animating for Democratic voters. I understand you're, not, you know, you're hesitant to talk about politics, but as we travel around the country, he's doing a bunch of events related to IRA, trying to boost Democrats, create a contrast. How come he doesn't do any events about abortion or talk more about abortion as he heads out to campaign trail races where all the candidates, they're, one of the number one issues for them is abortion and protecting that right. Um, we just don't see that from him. I would, I would disagree. The president has talked about the Dobbs decision and how much it's, a, it's going to affect and change and has, we've seen, uh, change the lives of women, millions of women across the country. Um, and how, again, this, constitu this, this constitutional right of almost 50 years 
uh, was taken away. This freedom was taken away. And he has, uh, he has spoken to that in, in, a, in, in a very, uh, I would say, in a very strong and passionate way. Uh, as you know, the vice president has led the, led the way on, on talking about uh, abortion rights specifically. It's been, it's been something that she has done a great job doing. And, uh, but one thing that we understand is that the, the Democrat, Democrats has something to, uh, to talk about, right? We have something to sell. Uh, we have something that we can share with the American people. And that is an economic plan uh, that is uh, lifting up people uh, that, that is focused on um, from the bottom up and the middle out. And we talk about Inflation Reduction Act because it's going to make a difference in people's lives. We talked about the bipartisan infrastructure law because it is historic and it's going to uh, invest in infrastructure uh, like roads and bridges. And when you go uh, to into states and cities, that is something that is those are number one issues for states and cities. Uh, we think about the Chips Act. He was uh, he was uh, in uh, he he traveled last week and talked about uh, how important it's going to see businesses coming back and manufacturing coming back and in in America and creating an opportunity for businesses to uh, uh, you know invest again uh, and something that we haven't seen in some time. So I think I think the not the problem, but the opportunity that we have is we have so much to sell and such important policies that's going to matter to the American people that we also have to talk about those things as well. Because he hasn't asked anything. This one on Saudi Arabia, OPEC Plus again. Yesterday you said that uh, the move made it seem that they were siding with Russia. Do you, does the president see this as an indication that they are uh, siding potentially with Republicans in sort of intervening in, in U.S. politics in a way, given that they obviously know the timing of the elections and the potential impact on gas prices and on, on Democrats politically? I, I can't speak for their intentions. That is, uh, you know, or their timing. That's not something that I can speak for. Uh, but what I can speak about is their decision. And um, in the time of global challenges, economic challenges that we're seeing, uh, this was a decision that was a mistake, and we can speak to that because it was actually something that we saw them do, uh, and it's going to hurt again. Uh, you know, economies, uh, you know, across across the globe that are middle, uh, lower income, and so this is a, a a bad decision, and so they will have consequences, as the president said uh, last night, and it was again a mistake. Is the president sad to see Tulsi Gabbard leaving the Democratic Party? I don't have any comment on that. I'm not going to comment on that. Just one more about the recession. What gives the president confidence that if there was a recession, that it would only be slight? And what does a slight recession look like? Can I just answer that question? I just went into a full, uh, kind of full detail of what the president uh, was talking about um, last night. Um, but... I think the most important thing, which is what we have said a couple times, you've heard me say a couple times, is that the message to the American people is that we have an um, uh, economy that is resilient, and it is resilient because of the economic policy that this president has put forward. Uh, because the president, uh, when he thinks about his, his economic policy, again, it's about building the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. It's just making sure we don't leave anybody behind. And we have to remember what the president, this president inherited when he walked in. He walked in into an economy where uh, businesses were shutting down, majority of schools were shut down, uh, and he had to put forward a comprehensive uh, COVID uh, strategy to make sure that people were getting shots in arms. And because of what he led with, with the American, um, the, the, oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh, AR, um, uh, his first economic policy that was passed, um, the American Rescue Plan, we were able to have uh, a, an economy that bounced back historically. And so what we're seeing is a strong job market. Uh, what we're seeing is um, an economy uh, that doesn't define what a recession would look like. Uh, and so we are going to meet these global challenges as we have, we're in a good position. Uh, than any other uh, any other um, uh, leading countries to meet these challenges, and that's what the president wants to make sure the American people understand, with, with the understanding that uh, there's always more work to do. 
Um, have you, has the White House talked, been in communication at all with Moscow over potential meeting to discuss Brittany Griner um, at the G20? Is there any movement on that or can you say anything about it? Uh, the president spoke about this a little bit this morning and as he said, he has no intention of meeting with President Putin and he strongly believes, um, um, you know, he strongly, uh, he strongly believes um, uh, that, um, you know, the Russians need to take this, the serious offer that we put forward on the table or make a serious counter offer uh, 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 to negotiate, but a, in good faith. And so, uh, again, he has no intention of meeting with Vladimir Putin. Um, do you guys have assurances that Ukraine and the Griner case are viewed as separate by Moscow? Or are there concerns that they're interconnected in terms of the president saying, I'm willing to meet with them on this, but not that? Is that something that the Russians have said? Again, like the idea that this Brittany Griner is not being held with any tie to seeking some type of concession related to Ukraine. Do you believe the Russians view the Griner case as separate and apart from what's happening in Ukraine and U.S. efforts to bolster Ukraine in the war effort? Look, I, I can't speak to how uh, Russia is perceiving this. I can't speak to how they're thinking through this. What I can speak to is what I just said, uh, which is that we have put a substantial offer on the table, a serious offer on the table. Uh, we are communicating uh, with Russia through various channels, as we have said before. Uh, and they, we believe, again, as I've said, that, uh, you know, uh, they should uh, take take this serious offer or uh, make a counter offer uh, in good faith. And so, um, you know, I mean, we have said this many, many times before, uh, Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan are being wrongly detained and we believe they should be released immediately. Uh, and that's always been, uh, that's always been our stance. Okay. Last time at the, the virtual fundraiser, uh, the president said he had to leave to go deal with something related to Ukraine. Is there any readout of what he went to go handle? No, I know he said that. I, I didn't check in to see what he was talking about, so I don't have a specific readout on that particular comment by the president. All right. Thanks, everybody. That's great.